Okay. Awesome. So, Ed McHugh, how are you, my friend? Gentlemen, how are you doing? It's great to see both of you guys. Yeah, doing great, doing yeah. great. We're really uh, happy you could be on the podcast today. Um, you know, we've worked together, I guess now I've been doing this bar owner thing for 14 years and it was, um, Goldstein was my, was my first attorney or who was your partner back then, right? I believe that was my predecessor, your predecessor, yeah. Barry Goldstein, who yeah. was a Titan in the industry. And Absolutely. I had the great fortune of being, uh, I guess one of his proteges, I guess you could say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And, um, you know, it started out with me. You, you did the initial liquor license transfer for me. Mm. And um, since we've done four, actually, one, one and one sale. You're sale my best one. client. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah <right. laughs> but, um, yeah, I think um, we, we really, you know, when I uh, was talking with you about bringing you on and, and having a conversation, I think, you know, what, what really touches the, the heartstrings of, of many people when they fall in love with the bars, you know, mm -hmm. everybody wants to be a bar owner someday. Oh, I want to buy a bar, right? I hear it. If I don't. If I don't hear it five times a week, then, uh, you know, something's, something's the matter, right? Something's going on. But you hear it all the time. And, you know, um, I've done everything from municipal transfers to, you know, from one municipality to another to um, just, you know, changeovers, uh, license ownership tra transfers. Mm -hmm. um, we've done extension of premise, right? And the, the first thing we did, I think, at Marty McGee's was we extended that outside area well before we had the deck, well before we had the beer garden. Mm -hmm. We just said we can... I think you mentioned it to my mm -hmm. old partner, Todd Martin, mm -hmm. um, Martin being Marty, Marty mm -hmm. McGee's. And, um, and we, we did it. And so we had to build this fence to connect the back door to the backyard. And then we were allowed to right, serve out yeah. there. And our thought was we'll do horseshoes or something. Mm -hmm. And now 14 years later, we're actually using, using the, uh, the backyard. Yeah. But um, it's been uh, an extension of premise. So we have a lot to cover. But um, you know, I think what would be great is to understand and we'll obviously talk about Pennsylvania, given that's predominantly sure. where, where I know you do a lot of work. Sure. Um, you can talk about other states that you do some work. But, you know, how do you become licensed? If I'm Joe Schmo off the street and I want to buy a bar, mm -hmm. um, you know, I love to hear, you know, what that transfer process is like. And then the second thing I love to get into is what if, you know, I owned a building on, mm -hmm. on uh, you know, Chester Pike, Lincoln Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, Main Street, whatever it might be and I wanted to make it a bar, what would that look like? Sure. So, uh, Joe, you bring up a great point. Uh, I have those encounters often where, you know, you, you have the person that uh, thinks it's his dream to, to own a bar, and, you know, uh, it's they don't really understand the difficulties in, in getting, number one, getting into the business, and then after you're in the business, actually maintaining sure. the business at, at some profitable level. Um, so I have those discussions all the time. You know, you see these people, they, they feel like, you know, the grass is, it's like the grass is always greener. They see your situation. Oh, this is great. You know, owning a bar. I don't really ever have to be there. The employees just run the show. Uh, you know, the beer arrives itself, you, right. you know, yeah. it manages it. And we all know that that's just being in the business. You, you guys being in the business, you know, myself being an attorney representing, um, you know, uh, many uh, entities in the hospitality industry. Um, you know, so we, you know, I, I have those discussions all the time and it's something that, um, you know, you, you have to advise them that, you know, it's, it's a, you know, number one, it's a difficult task to, uh, you know, to acquire a liquor license. You know, obviously you got to have resources. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just the process itself, actually going through, the um you know you got to make sure you know the background checks sure. you know all, all of those things have to be in place even before you consider you know uh, getting involved in any kind of uh, liquor license um yes yeah, so talking specifically about pennsylvania um and this applies to a lot of the states in the union i believe um is you know you're really dealing with like a three-tiered system where you have a manufacturer's license, you have wholesale licenses, you have retail licenses. And basically that was created after prohibition, really in an effort to prevent overreaching from one class to the other. Sure. You know what I mean? Just basically it was, you know, where, um, you know, the legislature didn't want, you know, uh, the, the entities that are controlling the manufacturing industry to reach over into the uh, wholesale industry and you know exercise um undue you know influence on, on on that and the same goes for the retail so 
um, that's the way it was created. That's the kind of it's it's the way it, it, it is now. Um, we all know all the rage right now is is really you know everybody wants to open up a brewery, everybody wants to open up a limited winery, everybody wants to open up a, a, a distillery, um, and they are popular now because. You know, like you did, Joe, like you did, PJ, you don't have to go on the open market and purchase a license, right? right. You don't have to pay $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 out in Chester County or whatever for for, for an R license. Um, R being retail, correct? Yeah, R being oh. retail. So, you know, you, you can basically, you know, if you meet the qualifications, if you meet the requirements, um, you can open up a, brew, a brewery. You can, open, you can open up a brew pub. Um, so, you know, that, that seems to be all the rage right now is those small breweries, those small brew pubs. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the application process with regards to that, uh, at least in Pennsylvania, it, it's, it, it's a two-tiered application process. You know, the, the, there's a federal application that you have to apply for. It's called um, TTB. It's based in Cincinnati. Um, you have to go, you know, a, a lot of what you have to submit to the, to the federal bureau is you also have to submit to the liquor board. Um, so it's two tiered. It's both federal and state. Um, there's physical requirements with regards to the actual, uh, physical layout, the building itself. You have to get through the one, uh, fence before you get to the other one or actually you do them simultaneously. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, you, you do them simultaneously. They both run around, around the same you know time period where okay. you know you're, you're probably looking at 120 days to 180 days okay. you know depending on the circumstances so um what's the benefit of that manufacturer's license in pennsylvania if it's a brewery license if, if it's a limited winery is you can serve your product on the premises right you can also offer other pennsylvania products uh that that Pennsylvania brewery product, that, that Pennsylvania limited winery product, that Pennsylvania distillery product, you can offer on on the uh, on the uh, premises, which is nice. You know, you don't, you know, it's it's something where um, you can almost operate as a restaurant in a sense without actually mm -hmm. having going going on the open market and getting that getting that license. Sure. Um, the other benefit for um, for breweries. So long as you don't get involved with, you know, contracting, you know, with, with wholesalers, with right. import distributors, is you can self-distribute. So you can self-distribute to other to, to licensees as a manufacturer's license. Ah, yes. You know what I mean? So that's that's a benefit, and that's you know that's why it's you know, uh, it seems to be an attraction to many, you know, many of the people who are interested in acquiring a liquor license yeah nowadays. that's a huge plus to be able to do that you know yeah. i remember i think this favor was one of the first ones to start doing that where they were delivering to to bars i'm like hell yeah you know i'm yeah. getting the, i'm getting a local product i'm getting something that um you know is was organic it was it was cleanly um, um manufactured nice looking uh, product all that and they're going to deliver it unlike the mm -hmm. the lc well the lcb does have third party People that will do that for you, but it's at a cost, right? It's true. Yeah, it's true. Now the requirement is you got to provide fifty percent of your own product in house right. in order to qualify for that for that um, for those advantages. Um, but you think about that, like someone you, you, you don't like if you wanted to open up a place out in Chester County, you, 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 you and if you don't you don't have four hundred five hundred thousand yeah, dollars to invest. Right. You you think about this this um, concept, you know. Maybe you hire somebody, maybe you hire a master brewery. Just start your brewing, you know. And then, you know, you can offer yingling. You can offer. Really? Yingling, you, too? Mm. Well, it's a Pennsylvania brewery. Sure, sure. Okay. You, well, that was, you, you yeah, took the question right yeah, out of So you can offer Sly Fox. You, you, oh, you can okay. offer, wow. you know, all of those, you know, very, you know, victory, you mm -hmm. know, all of, you know, tropes. All, you know, and sometimes when you go in there, you don't even realize, well, where's the Coors Light or right, where are right. the other ones? That, because you have so much to select from, yeah. you know. So that's that's a, that's a huge advantage. Um, then you have the wholesaler, right? You got the wholesale license, right? That's something that's uh, really the packaged goods, you know. That's and you know, I mean, we could probably spend the whole podcast on discussing, you know, IDs and, and distributorships and you know, sure. you, you know, uh, the, the contracting process, et cetera. Um, but then you have the the retail license, which is probably the most popular license, uh, which is really the one that falls under the quota. 
that's the one that falls under all right well you know one license for every three three thousand inhabitants right. within the county so you know if you want to acquire a, re- a restaurant liquor license or an eating place liquor license we have to go and buy one you know you right. guys know but you, you, yeah you right. guys know that you got to go acquire right. one you know um and depending on the county you know that's going to, that's going to really determine what the price is going to be with regards to the license delaware county you know pre-covid you're probably talking about two hundred thousand. you know right. philadelphia pre-covid you're probably talking about two hundred thousand. you know chester county's crazy money um and and really Montgomery Bucks County, they're they're probably up around three hundred three three hundred and fifty thousand. Really, dollars. I didn't realize that much higher. Yeah. yeah. So you know you you have to look into the counties and see you know and there's brokers out there that can help you out in sure, that regard. Sure. Or if you want to call your, your liquor attorney, you can you know you can find that information out. Um, but there's things you want to do, and you want to make sure that you do your due diligence in in in, in acquiring a liquor license. You want to make sure. Number one, call the liquor board. Make sure the license is in good standing. Yeah, sure. Make sure they're um, they're renewed. It's renewed, validated. You guys know that process. Yep. The taxes are clear. Yep. Um, you know whether there's a conditional license and agreement attached to the license. Um, now, can you explain that? Yes, yeah. I've heard yeah. a few of those before. So, so you, you do you have a CLA on on any of your licenses? I don't believe so. You don't believe so. <laughs> That would have been my job, right? Let me call my attorney. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So uh, there are, there's this process, whether it's done through the initial licensing process or it's done during the time that you hold your liquor license, where a CLA can be introduced, okay? And that could be through the initial licensing process where you have protests or petitions to, to your application process okay. and now all of a sudden the neighborhood gets involved they they're worried about noise they're worried about overcrowding ah, so they're worried about parking oh, okay. they're worried about all these quality of life issues and they and, and, and they're not they're not going to agree to support your application un, un, unless you agree to something i see so you can contest it you can go to a hearing many times you do you know because who wants to be saddled with a conditional sure. licensing agreement but there are times when time is of the essence right you know, what are they really looking for as far as the conditions go? Are they reasonable? And if so, you put together a conditional licensing agreement and it's authorized by the liquor code. It's, it's a process you gotta go through with the Bureau of Licensing. And so you come to an agreement and if, if the terms are agreed to and, and the agreement's adopted by the board, then the protestants withdraw their, their uh, opposition and you, and you, and you, you know, you get your approval letter and you, and you, you know, you're permitted to, uh, mo- yeah, operate, move on. Um, there is a process in when, when you have a, a bad operating history where you gotcha. have, you know, um, a situation where, uh, it could be the liquor board, could be other agencies get involved where, uh, you know, there there's issues with your operation, whether it's, you know, you're open late, you're serving minors, right. you know, you're serving VIPs, you got issues, you know, loitering, things of that nature. And all of a sudden you get police complaints, liquor enforcement starts to get involved, you start to, to accumulate citations. And then all of a sudden you get a non-renewal letter from the liquor board. Right. And now you're in a situation. So there are there are circumstances where you may go through a hearing process, and at the end of the hearing process, the liquor board may say, "Well, here's here's a conditional licensing agreement. We want you to consider these conditions, and if you do so, we'll renew your license." Gotcha. Okay. So that's a circumstance for which you know that that process may present itself. I don't know about you, my blood pressure went up about twenty points during yeah. this conversation. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I mean it's. You're right, though, PJ, yeah. because you know you get one of those letters. That's you know, it's like your livelihood. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. what? My, yeah. my, my liquor license is at stake. You know, so uh, that's uh, so that's the CLA process. Um, well, uh, one question before you move on: mm-hmm. Can the contesting party carry this on as long as they want, or will the judge rule on it? And or you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, does so, it take them to retract it in order for you to get rid of the CLA? Oh, it's a great question, PJ. So, 
Yes. So there are, that can be handled a number of ways. Negotiate into the CLA a, 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 an expiration date. Okay. Okay. Right. Many times the liquor board won't do that. So now you have like a CLA that just goes on indefinitely unless you petition the liquor board to rescind or modify that CLA, which can be done. You really have to have a period of time where you're, you're operating well and you right. don't have any citations and, and then the liquor board may consider it. Many a times it's done through the transfer process. You get a new owner in there, you know, or, or you're moving the license from place to place. Now that's sometimes those those conditions may not even apply to the new place gotcha you know so yeah that's a great question pj because you know you, you go to purchase a license and now they have they're saddled with this conditional license and agreement and you know your your the buyer is not going to agree to right. any of these and it's so you have to kind of overcome that and uh you might have to incorporate that into the agreement of sale that that being you know a condition of the sale is that i get this cla rescinded or right. or somehow um modified to my liking right you know so yeah you have that process um you know uh but where were we with regards to the to the uh well, we were talking a little bit about you know the, the overall transfer mm -hmm. and, and kind of how that goes i think you know person to person is probably the first kind of sure. scenario that i think i'm most interested in hearing about right, right i think right. that's the one that at a blanket level, like you said, yeah. you have to buy, they're not making new licenses, mm -hmm. right? You know, they're not making sure. any more land, right? You sure. have to buy one that exists, at least today. And in fact, I mean, it's possible that they could, based on an increase in inhabitants. You'd, that's very rare. It's rare, right? That's, yeah, that's very what, rare. That's my understanding. They didn't do it with the so they have the, right? they have the auction process. Yes. They yes. do have the auction process. So that's something that's available to people. Uh, you I, know, bet, I bet every time. <laughs> you know, of course, you know. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> and Semi you know, veteran. yeah. So, well, so that's like a, is that you know, you know what I mean. You're yeah. keeping your eye on. So the, the liquor board takes away, but then they give back, yeah, right? Sure. They, yeah. they take away with uh, the non-renewal process, but then you know they give back. But uh, yeah, so the person-to-person -person transfer is, you know, I'm not going to say the easiest, but it's most probably, common, probably right? the most common, yeah. and it's um, it's a situation where it, you know. If it involves the real estate, you do it all in one shot. You, you, you know, you put an agreement of sale together that, that includes the real estate, includes the liquor license. What you know, Joe, you've been involved in yeah, these, sure. like FF&E, Goodwill, um, and the process is a little easier with regards to to, to the licensing process because although you got to you got to post that placard, that that mm -hmm. orange placard, it's already licensed, so right. you don't have the health and welfare issues. If there's something with regards to the background of the principles, you know, there's, there's issues with regards to character and reputation, that may prevent the, the, the application from going through. But really, because it's already licensed, although you got to put the public on notice about it, in all likelihood, it's probably going through because it's a person or, it's a person, or person transfer. Right. You're, it's, 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 now, if you're expanding, like you know like you you know or you know any you know even in these covid days now you, have, you know people are expanding into the parking lots etc that's a different situation that's almost like a double transfer because now you're expanding your licensed areas and you know that is something that if the public wanted to get involved in and oppose it which you know i mean obviously who wants who wants people partying at midnight out you know where they can you know they can hear them from their bedroom windows right sure so that's different. That would be something where, you know, uh, it would be not only a person to person, but you would also have what we call an extension of premises application. And that's something that could could be contentious. Right. And when you do an extension premise today, that is today, the LCB does that based on contiguous space, correct? So if you have a correct. licensed premise, correct. you're extending that. That's like correct. Basically. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah so everything's got to be contiguous. Yeah, it, there are these hard and fast rules that you're familiar, you're be becoming very familiar with sure. that are just, um, you know, sometimes it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense as to why these things are in place. But, you know, it, it, you know, these laws were passed back when a time when, you know, it was right after Prohibition, you know, it was, uh, you know, and we, it's a, they were passed by very conservative Quaker-like kind of sure. uh, legislators. So, uh, and a lot of it's still in place. The liquor board's getting better though. They've modernized, you know, a lot of the a lot of the areas of licensing. You know, like 
you know, like the off-premises catering permit, sure, like they sure. make that available now for, for licensees that if you want to have a function and off the licensed areas, like whenever some, you know, a festival somewhere, yeah, you know what I mean? If you want to go farmer's ahead, market, type far, thing. farmer's yeah. market, you want to go ahead and acquire an off-premises catering permit. You can do so. It's a $500 application fee. There's these, all these conditions that apply that, that you got to make sure you have in place, you know, ramps, uh, service got to be ramp certified and things of that nature. But you can go ahead and acquire that off-premises catering permit and, and, you know, not only provide the food, but provide the alcohol at that, at that event. It's, you know, it's so from that perspective, they're, you know, they're moving in, in the right direction. Can you do that out of county? I think you can, PJ. Okay. I think you can do that anywhere within the Commonwealth. I'd have to confirm, I'd have to get confirmation on that, but I believe that that's the case. So it's not limited to your county. You'd be able to cross county lines and actually have, have an event like that. So I definitely want to dig more into the catering license because there's sure. some really interesting, uh, A, I believe that alone, I, and that was in Act 139 of 2016, I believe, yes, or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So, Joseph. You hiring? I mean, you hiring? Yeah. Come on, I could be paralegal. <laughs> no, I, well, I think, it, because I think that was also when uh, casinos got 24 hour and we didn't get VGTs. That was a big and, act. Yeah, that was whatever. a big, was big. act. That was. Yeah, we, we got uh, some crumbs here. Always. <laughs> but I think it really increased the value of our license. I tr truly believe it. How you do, you know, 50 events a year, which I believe is the current limit, um, that are, you know, farmers, markets, whatever, mm -hmm. and make money doing them. Because I've, I've been a part of them in the past where you don't make any money. It's not worth the effort to put everything on a trailer and go to a farmer's market. Sure. But, um, you know, I do believe that it's increased the value of our license. And I believe there's some creative things that you can do that fall within the guidelines, which, which I love to get into. But before I do, I'm really interested in um, municipality transfers if, sure. if we're transferring within say delaware county um we're transferring you know a license to a new location when you endeavor to, to purchase a license especially when when it's in, in the counties in philadelphia it doesn't matter because philadelphia is its own its own, its own county so right. you have to you don't have to make these considerations in, in, in philadelphia but in the counties you, you know part of your due diligence is all right well i'm taking a license from Aston, and I'm and I'm going to move it into Springfield Township. Okay, what's the climate in Springfield in Springfield Township? Because I got to go through the receiving municipality, and I and they're going to hold a public hearing on on this application. And you know, are they going to be um, you know receptive to this? Are they going to be uh, you know? oppose this you know what is the climate of the receiving the township it's important because many of the townships are very knowledgeable about this statutory provision it gives them wide latitude it gives them almost unfettered discretion to all right well we want it we don't want it um and you know they don't have to approve it right um many a times during the um transfer process this situation is almost overlooked. It's almost, you know, the parties believe that, all right, well, this is just a slam dunk. Why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't the receiving municipality want me? I'm going to be a great, I'm going to be a right. restaurant. I'm going to be paying taxes. Yeah. I'm, I'm going no, to be an great asset. Idea. I'm going to be an asset to the community. Yeah. Well, it's, they don't want alcohol. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it's the nature of the beast. It's, 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 as soon as that orange placard goes up, people think that it's just bad things are coming. So that's it, an absolute, dead on consideration that you have to have during the due diligence period prior to even really getting involved in the um the, the agreement phase uh if if you, if you do you know there is if you do get involved after the agreement is signed i mean that should be like an immediate consideration you know the call to the solicitor call to the, the, the chairman, somebody associated with the township that knows the landscape that is going to be able to tell you because there's Many of the municipalities, you know, for example, you know, Radnor Township really doesn't want any more liquor licenses. In, right. In their, in, now, there's ways to overcome it. You know, we talked about the conditional licensing agreement. You know, you can incorporate that process into the, the you know, the, the, the township process. You know, um, but nonetheless, it's still, you know, you have to get that resolution in place before you make that application to the right. liquor board. Um, so... The important thing that you do, if it's a situation where your 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 client is committed, or the you know the the applicants committed to this process, you know they got a lease in place, you know they already made a certain financial investment to this location. 
um, they need a liquor license here. You got to be very careful as, ha- as to how you handle that in a municipal liquor license hearing before the Board of Commissioners. You know, you got to make sure you present your client. You got to make sure you put certain information and, and, and evidence on the record. You got to make sure you have your, your court reporter in place, uh, have your exhibit packet together, and just have a very prof- professional presentation. Um, and they may they may still deny it, but at least you right. have some you, you you have you know some ammunition if and when you got to take an appeal to the local court of common pleas. Do you have gotcha. statistics on how many of them are shot down, percentage wise? Um, I don't, but you know they're, 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 it, you know it's it's not like I said, PJ. You really should probably check out the landscape before you even sure. do it because, yeah. you know, um, that'll... It's then, a gamble. Yeah, because then you can advise your client, listen, this is this is probably, an, you know, this is an uphill battle. Right. You know, they're going to challenge you. The people are going to come out. And, you know, right. it's a public hearing. You, you know, the, the, the residents can, can, you know, be vocal. So um, I don't, statistically speaking, Just you curious. know, I don't know. It's, you know... Out of ten applications, you know, maybe two or three, maybe two, three, four are are, are probably denied. Okay. Um, so it's really incumbent upon the applicant and its counsel to go to the solicitor, go to to the to the, um, and then you know, get, get an understanding of how they're going to receive your application because right. you know, and it's always required. There, there's no way to bypass. So, yeah, right, there's there's right. no way can't to just, bypass yeah. it. Yeah. Can, hey, sign this can the township or the borough where it's exiting protest it as well? No. Okay. No, no, that would be, uh, yeah, that they have no standing to do it. So, but you know, that, that, uh, process is something that's, you know, really should be a strong consideration. Yeah. You know, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, you need to almost have that, you need to have that set up and slam dunk before you even get involved. A hundred percent. And really, to be honest with you, that should be part of your process, just the total licensing process that you're going through. Because, you know, let's just say, you know, you're just you're going to transfer the license within your municipality. You don't have to go through the township, right? Well, but you're moving it from one side of the township to the other. Well, you know, you still you have to post that orange placard. Sure. They're still going to have an opportunity to to oppose it. Why not? You know, my you know theory is why not contact the civic leader or the community leaders right. before that orange placard goes up right get let's that temperature talk, let, let's let's you know show up at the next civic meeting let's talk about you know you know you know introduce your client you know this is what we plan to do this is our concept here's our menu these are our hours of operation you know we plan to be ramp you know we're going to have all our service ramps certified you know, we're, we're, you know, we're going to make sure that, you know, we, we, we don't overserve, and this is how we're, we're going to make sure we don't overserve. We're not going to have people outside loitering and smoking, and this is how we're going to do, handle You know what I mean? Because that's what they want to hear. Right. They, obviously, they have concerns. They're always right, going to have right, concerns. Right. Makes perfect sense. So I think that that's, um, I think that's great. Um, it really, I think, paints a picture of kind of the options if you want to get into the game, mm-hmm. so to speak. So we've been... Um, you know, we mentioned the catering license mm-hmm. thing before, and before we, I guess, dig into some of the you know thoughts and ideas and creative ways that they, they can be used, because I think they're, I know for a fact they're underutilized. Yeah, today. sure. Very few people that are using them. Um, describe what what exactly it is. Yeah. So, 2016, I think it, it became effective. What January 2017, something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. So, the liquor board made available to retail licensees but i think brew pubs can also apply for these i'm not sure i would have to get confirmation so it would be restaurants eating places and i think i don't know about hotels but nonetheless it's available to uh certain retail licensees that they can apply for an all-premises catering permit to hold events off their licensed premises now there's a deadline to that I think it's March 1st. Yes. So if you apply after March 1st, it's a headache. There's, there's, there's like hoops you got to jump through and it's, it's, you know, so, you know, if you, if you can get it done prior to March 1st, it's, it's such an easier process where they make available to licensees to, uh, hold these events. Um, it can't, these events, there's certain restrictions on them. And I, PJ, I think it is, you know, throughout the whole state, you know, so, um, there's certain inf- there's certain information that you got to provide to the liquor board you know all right well you're going to hold the event 
where is it going to take place what's the address what's the dimensions of the areas you want to have licensed you know um there's going to, there's other information you got to provide them as well um, like the approximate number of people to be accommodated. You got to have sure. a catering record of all the, of this information, et cetera. And then there's other information that you also have to make sure you, you, you comply with. Um, we touched on that, but it's, it's, you know, all the service have to be ramp certified. Sure. The event can't go past midnight. Right. Right. It can only be five hours. I think they're contemplating maybe the possibility of expanding that. Yeah, there's a couple of things on the docket now. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, um, well, we can talk about that. Yeah, a but bit that's so at this point, it can't go past five hours. So if you if you have an event that goes past five hours, I think what you have to do is, is stack your the permits. You know what I mean? So right. have one after the other, but um, it has to be a catered event. So it has to involve the food. service of food. It has to, has to be prearranged. You have to notify enforcement. So liquor enforcement has to be, they have to be notified at least seven days in advance. And I think you have to notify the local police. Okay. So. Makes sense. Yeah. Those, I don't have the, the all of the, you know, requirements in front of me, but sure, those sure. are the general ones that, you know, just come to mind. And if all of those things are in place, you can have these events. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a, like you talked about, Joe, it's a great opportunity for yeah. licensees to you know like maybe it's a weekly thing that you're yep. going to have at a certain location like you you know like you said a farmer's market and a festival mm -hmm. or something there's 50 a year right i think there's 52 i think it's 52, 52. okay yeah. yeah i think it's 52 so you know a couple a couple ideas right it's just to put a finer point on it mm -hmm. for everybody listening to understand exactly what we mean i can with my license once a week mm -hmm. go to a park assuming that the municipality allows it exactly, right, and all yeah. that and set up a quote unquote beer garden Mm -hmm. and for five hours serve alcohol with my ramp certified employees mm -hmm. at this location. It's, I mean, it's something, and we can do that every week or, you know, 52 times a year. Sure. Right. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, I mean, it, it's very powerful. I, I know for a fact that licensees are not leveraging this today. Yeah. Where we first started seeing it a lot was in Philadelphia. That's County. Right. These, beer gardens. These, these empty lots popped up as beer gardens. And that's what I, what I learned about this, concept of license stacking right like where you sure, have multiple sure, licenses because sure, sure. these things were open from like noon till two sure so it was like how's sure. that happening you know right they're right, just, right. they run in and gunning and right. <laughs> or whatever but you know another great opportunity uh i feel that um more licensees in pennsylvania should do is the concept of these um you know these like holiday uh bars mm -hmm. like yeah. tinsel was one of them i think near us yeah, where yeah, yeah. it's a christmas themed bar I want to like, you. you know yeah, uh, there was another one. I mean, it was a Mexican place, and yes. it was like it was just with the, with the garage front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and it was um, phenomenal you know, it, job. It was it was just gaudy Christmas decorations, right. but right. you know, it, but it worked, and and yeah. they took an existing establishment and just converted it for the holiday. But in that scenario, because we're talking fifty-two times a year, mm -hmm. if I don't use my license all year, can I run fifty-two days in a row? Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. So that's huge. I mean, yes. that's huge for that holiday. Exactly. You go from pretty much. Thanks or uh, Halloween straight to New Year's, and in a situation like yours where you have multiple places and you have access to multiple permits, right. you know you can really you have tremendous flexibility to you know have as many you know as many you know if if you own three or four places now you have you know what, what is that like two hundred and some or yeah, you know, true. whatever yeah, it is right. yeah. so you have th that that number of events available to you that you can have off so like you said well you know if, if that's the case well maybe i can you know at a certain location maybe i can be open thursday friday and saturdays right so, right you know what i mean in a sense you know you it's just you, it's just you got to make sure that you comply with all of the requirements of, yeah. of, of that statute because you know because it's um I think people may be having those events and, you know, they may be complying with like maybe 75% yeah. of what they need to comply well, with. Yeah. And, and to, to your point, PJ, I don't think he can sub it out. Okay. I, I, you know, th that may be something that p people, you know, endeavor to do or, you know, it, maybe they do do it. But, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, it has to be the licensee that's actually holding the event. Yeah, and I'm you sure know. the state wants their tax money from that licensee and all that, right? right so right. It, it can get it can be a little bit of right. an accounting, but number, there right? is but flexibility and there is possibility with with, with those all premises catering permits. Yeah, and, and another idea I've had this is like the things I think about when I'm going to bed at night mm -hmm. is 
I have three licenses. I should be chasing down diners. Yeah. Why would they not do, right. you know, Saturday brunch with a but, limited mimosa bar or something, right? right. We'd have to then right. provide staff and, and yeah, do the yeah, whole thing. Exactly. But, but, I mean, it seems like I'd be a win-win, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so just keep in mind that when you consider these kind of things, that, you know, the licensee has to be the operator, you know? The, right. You know what right, I mean? So right. just keep that in mind that, you know, it's... it's you got to worry about insurance, too, that's for sure. That's the other yeah. thing. you got to call your carrier and make yeah, sure, sure that, you know, because uh, that's, you know, that those events are covered. And listen, I think some of the carriers are already, you know, familiar with, yeah. with the process yeah, they because are. it's been com become such common. My, my recent um, policy, I use a Grub Insurance Agency yeah. over, in, over in Jersey, and yeah. my recent policy literally it, outlined catering, and it, yeah. it was like it included. It already incorporates yeah, it. Yeah, so they must have just updated it yeah. recently. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's why it might cost went up too but you know whatever <laughs> i get it insurance know. is not Can't going mess with down. insurance it's not going down no it isn't no. it isn't no so oh great so yeah I, th I think i think there's some real creative ideas there that licensees should really look at at least you know again we're talking in the, in the confines of of uh pennsylvania right for for people listening yeah so but, that so that is in the confines of pennsylvania I, I don't know if that's available in new jersey i don't believe it, it, it is available in new jersey um you know and that's when you know uh, I tell you that, you know, Pennsylvania's modernizing. I mean, I think we went through that phase where, there, you know, when, when Ridge was in place and, and you know, some of his successors where they explored the idea of privatizing. Right, right. You know right. what I mean? They, they never got to that stage, but they got to the point where I think they knew that they had to modernize mm -hmm. some some of the aspects of the liquor code to, 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 bring, it, to bring it into the, you know, to the modern age and, and, and to accommodate businesses, right. You know, so they, they can have flexibility to, you know, to, you know, to make their product available. Right. You know, I, th I think that that was something that was definitely, um, a, an effort by, by the liquor board to, to, to get, you know, to do that. And, you know, it's funny, the comparison with New Jersey and, and Pennsylvania. Everybody thinks that New Jersey, how it's it's just, you know, they're the the, the free um, state. You know, we're we're, we're the controlled, right. confined state. We right. got the state stores, and, but really, New Jersey is that's not an easy process either either to get licensed over there. Now, obviously, they don't have the state stores. You know, they they sure, have they sure, have the, yeah. the 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 privately owned yeah, private, yeah, yeah. liquor stores and wine stores, but their licensing process is probably more. Um, more difficult than the liquor board. I mean, me you got to go through a fingerprinting. You know, you go through a credit check. You know, the state trooper comes to your house. You know, it's it's something that's you know they're very serious about, um, you know, the licensing process over in New Jersey, and rightfully so. You know, uh, and their enforcement process is just as is just as, you know, um, strict. Yeah. As, Pen as Pennsylvania, you know, so, you know, you get hit with something over there, you know, it's probably going to be a lengthy suspension of your liquor license, you know, it's, really? it's, it's no joke. So, yeah. So I, I think that that's a, that's a, you know, we talk it's about a misconception. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it is. And, you know, I, most of my stories have come from, you know, the shore towns, sure. Wildwood, yeah. and, you know, stuff yeah, like right. that. And of course, all kinds of, um, stories which we won't dive into but um you know of, of suspensions and stuff and a sure. lot of it's related to underage and, and whatnot but yeah. i think it's a good transition into you know the the side of the side that we don't see um you know enforcement and you mm -hmm. know the sort of the dreaded call uh, mm -hmm. that you might get at two thirty in the morning that the police are here or yeah, that of course you know the, the state police came in and, and and did some sort of um I don't know. Maybe they found an underage, or, or maybe there were sure. some. I think the most common things are probably sales after hours. The scenario where, you know, Mickey the regular comes in every day. At, he gets done at, down at Boeing at, at eleven o'clock at night. Yeah, back me up, and he puts one on ice, and he pays for it before two, and all of a sudden yeah. it crosses the threshold of the bar at two fifteen. That's the, that's and the there's classic an LC, one. There's an LC agent just hanging in the corner. That's the classic. You know, one. finishing yeah. a rum and coke. What, what's up with LC agents? Do they have to order a rum and coke in a Miller Lite? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like every time <laughs> I've that, had, I've had the privilege. Tell sign that that's an <laughs> undercover officer. Yeah, I'm gonna get. A, I'm gonna set my POS to text me every time that comes. <laughs> yeah, you used to be able to tell by shoes and all that stuff. Not He's got to improve your camera system. Yeah, you know? right. yeah. No, but I mean, it. I'll say it's it's it. They're a pleasure to work with. They have they are. Absolutely. And it's a lot less 
14 years in for me now, it's a lot less scary than it used to feel. Like I, when the LCBs used to show up, I used to get a pit in my stomach. And mm -hmm. I like, I didn't know if I wanted to go there and, and see them or I wanted to like mm. run the other way, you know? But, great um, point, Joe. They, they become really great to work with, especially w w w some of the stuff we went through, um, you know, with COVID. Like they've been, they didn't want to, I think the, the gentleman's exact words, well, we don't want to step on your neck. We want to come here and see compliance. They were very empathetic. You know? Yeah, they, they were. Um, but I mean, getting into, so, you know, I don't want to dive into COVID no. at this point, just because I think, you know, we will come out of this and I think we'll be stronger than ever as an industry. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more about like, I guess some scenarios of, of um, you know, uh, possible suspensions, mm -hmm. um, you know, common... Uh, citations and kind of sure. some of the work that you you know you deal with from a yeah. legal aspect. So yeah, uh, I, I agree with it, guys. I think liquor enforcement has become much more professional. I shouldn't say much more professional, but as an agency now, they are very business friendly. You know, uh, you, you know they have a job to do. You know, and, and you, you got to let them do their job. But you know, I don't think it's a situation where they're you know they're really looking to you know take your legs out or, or you know really do, do do damage to to your to your business and they're simply just looking to you know do their job enforce the liquor code and you know um if they see a problem you know they'll you know they have to you know they have to bring it to you know to, to the surface so um i agree with you in that respect uh but it is you know situation and i don't think you you guys haven't experienced this but you know there are bars where you don't even know what's happening right. you know because they're all undercover visits most you know most times yeah, they, sure. they do do open inspections and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature but a lot of you talk about after sales after hours you know they, they see an, a visibly intoxicated patron on the premises which is the yeah. vip the vip yeah, yeah, so yeah, they're making right. certain observations on the premises and you know, uh, you know, three months later, you don't even know this is happening. You just get a letter in the mail. Yeah. That, that, you know, here here are the violations. And if they're serious violations, if they are what the liquor code cons considers enhanced offenses, and and you you know, you really don't have to accumulate too many of them. You know, if if you get if you get two or three citations within a relatively short period of time, within I would say three or four year period you're going to be a candidate for possibly a non-renewal action right. or at the very least you got enforcement's attention now especially if if, if you serve the minor right. they're coming back sure. you're going to do a compliance case on you you know and if you fail that if you don't have the proper systems in place which is probably the case because that's how they got the you know the, the minor in the first place mm -hmm. right. you i mean before you know it you're going to be subject to a non-renewal and you're putting your license at risk and it's happened so quickly that um, you know it really it, it becomes an issue for for the bar owner you know maintaining his license you know now all of a sudden he's he's in the constraints of of, of, a, of a, a real strict CLA you know right. or, or or maybe you know maybe he does it you know maybe he's, he you know they, they decide all right well no you, you've abused your licensing privileges and we're taking your license away wow, wow. you know what I mean. Does that happen common, or is it kind of? Well, a, let me say this to you. I, I, I think the liquor board is becoming um, more with the non-renewals now. This, you know, we were right. discussing enforcement, and that's kind of sure. you know that's the separate process. You know, if you do accumulate a number of citations and become subject to a non-renewal, I think the liquor board is becoming more serious in recent years in that process, and they are, uh, they are. Um, considering more so now at revoking liquor licenses than they have in the past. That's my experience. Right. That's my experience. So it's got to be a, something that you, you it has to be handled very carefully, and it, it has to be something that's you know, uh, you know, the preparation has to be you know the preparation for the because there's going to be a hearing for, in sure. all in all the non-renewal matters there's going to be a hearing yeah. so the preparation for that hearing has to be you know uh, very thorough and and you know you have to put some time into to, to making sure that you presented a very compelling case and um yeah so but getting back to the enforcement process uh yeah so 
that's something that you know is all authorized by the liquor code you know where they have the bureau of liquor control enforcement which is really an arm of the state police yep. okay and you know in, in in our area in the philadelphia in, in the delaware county area the philadelphia area you know they operate out of Phil, uh, the philadelphia office they're right there in south philly mm-hmm. so they're in charge of philadelphia chester and Delaware counties, and then you have, you know, they're, they're, they're basically district offices. And then you have the northern counties, Montgomery, Bucks, Allentown, Lehigh County, Berks County, you know, all of those are handled by the office in Allentown. And, uh, yeah, so they ba- their job is, you know, to, to, you know, to conduct investigations. A lot of them are undercover. Sometimes they're open investigations. Sometimes they'll show up at your place and, you know, it's they got a, a complaint that you know you don't have your your, your health permit or something so right. they'll do an open inspection and just all right let me see your let me see your health permit let me see your, your you know your liquor and beer receipts let me you know tap cleaner records tap right. cleaner yeah, records yeah. let me let me see all that stuff and then you know and and you know then, then they leave you alone uh but you know, so that's a process that you got to be aware of when you're a licensee, you know, and really it's probably incumbent upon all current licensees, all new licensees is to go through that ramp process. Right. That ramp proce- process is, is really such a, an asset to many of the the bar owners and, and, and restaurant owners, educates them in the enforcement process, yeah. educates them in the non-renewal process educates them in the proper way to do things with regards to youthful patrons educates them with regards to noise music right you know um and that's a responsible alcohol management program that's right? yes thank which, you Joe. which which a lot of people outside of pennsylvania would be familiar with tips that's correct right? tips. Which that's another program of, same sort of idea right more national scale right? exactly so that's more of a national scale so yeah the responsible alcohol management program is is something that you know not only does the liquor board offer it, but it, you know it also you you, you can get a um, a certified uh, instructor uh-huh. if right. you want someone to come out to your place and actually you know if you have a big place you have you know an abundance of employees and you want everybody to gather you want everybody to you know, to take the course I don't know if that's available in the COVID world right but, right, but right. that you know sure. at, at one you know pre COVID that was available they do enough of them anyway I mean yeah. But a lot of it's online now. Yeah, it is. It is. A lot of it's online. We just did a refresh. And you know, it's it, it's the owner manager, uh-huh. you know, and then it's it's server it's the program. it's the server it's the server training, you know, and then you got to make sure you have all your signs up, you know, and and you got to you know every two years you you, you got to go through that process again, right? And it's I think it's invaluable because you know it, it kind of opens, you know, the eyes of, of the bar owners, uh-huh. the bartenders. Wait, what is I got to scan IDs? Sure, right. What, what is, Takes gotta, the owners off of management on uh, training them. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know what I mean. And what what time we got to stop stop serving? Right, you know what I mean. Like a lot of people uh, don't know. Yeah, you know, and uh, and what do I got to look for in a patron if he if he's you know if he stumbles or if he, you know, I suspect something? You know, what I mean, all those kind of things. And listen, there's criminal liability that attaches to a lot of these. Sure, things. you know what I mean. So theoretically. You know, the the bartender that that serves that VIP. You know what right. I mean, or you know, or serves that minor. There, there's like criminal liability that attaches to that. So there's all kind of repercussions because the 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 the, the minor is going to get charged. The minor's you know the minor's going to get charged for you know underage drinking if they if they presented a false identification they're right. going to get charged with that. Right. So he's hung up or she's hung up. You know because they're going to lose their license. You know and. But not nonetheless, you know, if really enforcement or local police, whoever it w- was, if, if if they wanted to really, you know, uh, you know, be be uh, strict about it, they 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 could actually arrest the, the person who did it, right. which, which would be the bartender, which is heartbreaking for the bar owner, right? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So Ed, we talked a lot about, you know, enforcement now, mm-hmm. and you know, some of the I guess you know the hot water you can get yourself in. Uh, my understanding is that that in our in our state they they came out with actual program for nuisance bars. Mm-hmm. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that or what that means? So, yes, there is a provision in the liquor code. It's it's, it's section six eleven of the liquor code, and hence it's called the six eleven action. And uh, it's more popular in the city and some of the more urban areas, I guess you could say. The more areas where you have the mixed zoned 
kind of like uh, you know population. Oh, like yeah, you know, people yeah. living upstairs. And exactly. Yeah. So yeah. when you truly do have those quality of life issues, you do have those um, nuisance activity really taking place over a period of time. And you know you may have enforcement involved, and they're doing undercover investigations, but it really hasn't led to the point where you know the license is at risk right and the community is looking for immediate action there's a program and, and there's a statute that authorizes a, 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 a 611 action which is a nuisance action which authorizes the bureau of liquor control enforcement the local da's office there's other entities that can also bring, actually the community can bring the action too as a private action if they, they can they can hire private counsel to bring this action, I I would have to review the statute again, but I'm almost sure of that. And so, it's an action that's brought in the court of common pleas of the local county, okay? And it's it's done by complaint, and it's done by affidavit, mm. where uh, on an emergency basis they can petition the judge to shut your place down for up to one year, if they can. Um, you know, uh, not only allege, but also provide s sufficient evidence that it, it, the place is, is, is operating as a nuisance. Now, what, is it, what does it mean to operate as a nuisance? I, th you know, I think you really do have to have those, you know, quality of life issues. You got to have, all right, well, a, a robust citation history. You know, maybe you have, the, you know, those, you know, the, the over-serving issue where, you know, you have the, the intoxicated patients outside the premises. Maybe you have vandalism. Maybe you have, you know, people urinating outside in the alleys. You have, you know, sure. you have police incidents that have taken place. You know, you have 911 calls to the, to the establishment. You know, maybe you have fights and other things that are taking place. Drugs is another one. You yeah. know, that's more popular. You know, that's a, that's a more popular action in, in, in the cities. But... All of those would be candidates for a, a 611 action. And I got to tell you, you know, I've been involved in defending licensees in, in that regard. If that comes down the pike, you, you, you have to seriously consider your options because yeah. it's, it's almost because, you know, it's a matter of time in, in, in essence. You know, yeah. this, this, is, this is something that is, is extremely serious. You're going to be looking at a judge that has a room full of community people and a bar owner, and he's got to choose between hmm. the two. And you know, I mean, it's it's unlikely if if the if the you know if the evidence is is credible uh, that he's going to rule in your favor. Right. So when you have a, a, an action that comes to your attention in, in that way, you have to seriously consider your options of because number one. You're going to spend a lot in legal fees. I mean, you're going right, to spend right. a ton in legal fees defending that case because you got to get your own experts. You, you, you know, you got you got to put a lot of money and time and preparation in defending that case. Um, and everybody's going to come together in that action: the local police, liquor enforcement, you know, whatever agencies are available to right. to, to, to the community. They're all going to come together and and testify against you and so it, it's going to be a, 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 a tall task to be successful in defending an action of that nature so you know the other things we talked about the enforcement actions you know those are things that are kind of accumulate over a period of time you, you know you can handle them you can manage them and there's ways to do it and then you have the non-renewal process which we talked yeah. about too you can handle them you can you can manage them they're very serious i'm yeah. not i'm not i'm not taking away about the seriousness mm -hmm. of them but if you, for those actions, those enforcement actions, those non-renewal actions, if you can, you know, these violations that come to your attention, if, if, if you can acknowledge them and do things to improve your operation, do things to prevent those things from happening uh, in the future, those are the things that the court and the hearing examiners are going to look at, the administrative law judges are going to look at and really embrace and take into consideration and if you do that along the way, you you have a good likelihood of being successful in those enforcement proceedings, in the non-renewal proceedings, the nuisance actions. It's just it's going to be very difficult to prevail. To you against the world. Yeah. So, um, though you know that that's something that is a uh, 
you know, uh, you really have to consider, all right, well, I'm probably going to wind up closing my business. All right. So, you know, do I make my license? You know, you really have to almost, you go into like damage control. All right. Right. What, What can I do to save my license? What can I do to possibly save my business? Can I move? You know, because you're past the point of, all right, well, if I put the camera system up, that'll improve my operation. If I hire a security team, that'll improve my operation. You're past that point. Right. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, you're past that, you know, if, if that's happening with the citation process or the non-renewal process, yeah. you can put some things in place that is going to curtail those things from happening in the future and, you know, you're going to do well going forward. But once you get to that 611 process, you're, uh, you know, you're you're past that point. Right. Yeah. Now, now that's something that, I mean, that, that takes time, right? That takes, it, it does. It, I mean, even for people to mount a case against you, it's right? True. It's not something, you can't just, because, you know, we, we deal in the summertime, especially with COVID, it's actually come up more, mm-hmm. um, which we'd be remiss if we didn't get into COVID. So we should, we should talk about that next. But, um, now that we're extending outside, well, now there's noise complaints, right? So it's yeah. a natural sort of thing that we, we've, a lot of licensees that I know have, have been dealing with. But, you know, um, they've also had, um, you know, LCE out there saying, no, you're, this is good. You know, like chatter is okay, but Amplify mm-hmm. Music isn't and all those things. Right. Um, so I, I feel like even though, um, you know, that, that segment of uh, you talking about the nuisance program seemed pretty grim. Yeah. It, it does it's, take a little bit of, you know. Joe, that's a good point to yeah. bring up. Are and you it's notified something... of it immediately? You, well, yeah, you would be notified of the filing okay. uh, if, if, if that was filed. But, you know, you, there would be a requirement that, that you would be served and, okay. and, you know, the process server would have to, you know, pro- provide you with, with the complaint. But you're right, Joe. It's not, it doesn't happen overnight. Sure. And it's really the way you handle it you know yeah, if it's something where you're just a rogue operator and you you know these things are coming to your attention and you know you're not you, you know you're not giving it due consideration and you're just operating you know status quo it, you know yeah it, it it does take time to, to, to you know to get to that point where you know a 611 is going to be filed but you know if you're not responding to the community, if you're not responding to the police requests, if you're not responding to enforcement asking you to do certain things, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you're, you're going to be held accountable at some, at some point in time, yeah. you know, and, you know, uh, but you, you are right. It doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, when you come to before the judge, you, you know, you, you should, you know, there you should have, you know, a number of incidents, you should have, right. you know, a number of violations you should have. And, and, you know, so it does happen over a period of years. Right. And th- so there's plenty of time to write the ship. Is yes. I guess, is I guess yeah. My, yeah, the yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. True. Awesome. Well, you know, we're living in this, um, you know, what feels at times post-apocalyptic world of, of COVID. And now um, at the time of this recording where, you know, vaccines are readily getting out there, which I'm, I'm you know, blessed to be able to get one early on as a as a oh, first great. responder and firefighter so that's been that's great that's been congratulations yeah. no, thanks it was great yeah um you know just you sleep better at night you know yeah. not worrying about that but it's been a crazy year um with regards to you know COVID. um pennsylvania has been a very and still to this day a very restrictive state um we did as of april uh, 4th just get our bars back meaning we can have mm-hmm. actually have patients sit at the bar um, where the curfew of 11 p.m., which was uh, just just crippling in an area um, such as Delaware County, where we have, you know, there's tons of th- th- three shifts, you know, around the clock sure. uh, businesses. Sure. You know, I think of Boeing. I mentioned Boeing because it's one sure. of the biggest employers in Delaware County. Sure. Delcora, uh, mm-hmm. Marcus Hill, and all the refineries. I mean, these are around the clock operations. Mm-hmm. And you know, my biggest thing that that I felt was that was difficult during this time with the, with the curfew was that. You know, I get people to get done at 10 o'clock at night or you know, 11 o'clock at night, work in a, a sort of overnight swing shift type thing or, or second shift, but the late because there's just so many different, you know, shifts and, and what else. And then you, you also have all the, you know, for us, um, both PJ and I, our, our businesses tend to be very industry friendly. Sure. So all the servers and waiters and waitresses from Outback and Applebee's, they're mm-hmm. coming to our, our bars, yeah. and, but, but it's 11 o'clock, yeah. so no yeah. dice. Yet it's yeah. Tuesday. These are the people that come in, 
by you know a couple rounds. They're each spending thirty forty hours, and they're each tipping thirty forty hours because they're especially early in the week. You're, you're so yeah. heavily dependent and, upon those and, hours. And and, and, and and then the food requirement, which is just we don't even need to talk about that anymore because it's gone. But it was just something that just mm-hmm. it was impossible to do. And we were set up for failure. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you know some of these things have changed. Some of these things have um, opened up. Um, meaning, you know, they're, they're less restricted now. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, if, you know, there was a scenario where things got a little bit worse from a case, case count perspective, sure, they wouldn't roll back all these uh, mm-hmm. these rules because they did not apply. They did apply to a 100-seat restaurant. A lot of them did make sense. Yeah. They did not apply to a local Irish pub right. or a corner bar or, you know, that sort of thing. But in any case, um, just curious to what what are your clients and licensees going through um you know i'm one of them and yeah. and we have a you know without getting details we have a scenario where we were we got a little nip for the food requirement thing and uh no. you know what's that like so joseph it's it's uh to be honest you guys are probably more of on the fortunate end of you know the, the, the you know the outcome of this COVID situation um you know, and you're right. Things have loosened up. You know, it's kind of it's it's kind of grueling because it's so slow. Like you know, you just you know, although you see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, there's no point in time. There's no like expiration of this. You know, this COVID situation. You know, but that's a great point. Yeah. I have many clients who have put their license in safekeeping, and uh, you know, did one of did, were, were, was we're trying to do one of two things either you know ride out the COVID until they could open back up or you know what it's really not even worth it for me to open back up or i don't even have the capital to 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 reinvest or open back up or carry me to the next month so therefore um i'm i'm going to sell so i have many clients who uh ed put my license in safekeeping and make it available for sale um which is unfortunate because you know you're talking about you know business owners that have been in business for years and it's and it's you know it's like Del, you know a lot of it's a lot of them are like you know Delaware County is you know uh, you know you have these uh, bars and these restaurants that have a tradition and 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 have you know their their life and and and, and you know the lifeblood of in this in this business and you know they they can't sustain they they're unable to sustain it so from that standpoint it, it's heartbreaking um that you know hopefully at this point uh the ones who've made it through you know mm-hmm. you, you know hopefully can you know can you know in the next couple months if we don't see another you know kind of you know increase in the restrictions hopefully right. that doesn't that's not going to happen you know, can survive these next couple of months until we, you know, we can get the vaccine yeah, to, to, together, to, yeah. to, to, to most That's of the right. Pennsylvanians, right? So, so hopefully we can get back to a more fully operational kind of industry. Um, you know, but, but get, getting back to what we talked about with enforcement and, in, 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 you know, in, in the COVID world, you know, I think they've been in, incredibly accommodating, you yeah. know what I mean? And I think licensing too has been incredibly accommodating and understanding and i think the liquor board's doing the best they can to to you know accommodate licensees you know we talked i don't know if we talked about it but you know the waiving of the fees in 2021 sure. you know and and the possibility of increasing the discount you know to licensees available when they make a purchase at the state store from 10 to 15 percent yeah well i think I like, I like to actually talk about all the legislative updates yeah I know you have a few but yes. we'll, we'll get to that um but you know i um you know Let's hope that that helps to accommodate, you know, the restaurant owners, the business owners, to to get to that next phase where they can, you know, they can, right. you yeah. know, op- you know, open, you know. But uh, most businesses are just hanging on, and, and yeah. you, know, you guys are, you know, you guys can attest to that, right? Sure, sure. You know, most businesses are just hanging on, keeping their employees, in, in, you know, working, yeah. and um, you know, just trying to maintain what you can until you, you, you know, think things open up. And it's, it's really unfortunate because, you know, getting back to what you talked about, Joe, you know, when it first hit, you know, obviously the hospitality industry was, was the industry that was really hit hit first and hit worst. And it was tough to justify, wasn't it? Yeah. 
it was like, well, wait a second, you're, you're you know, wh- you know, why why can people walk into Target and wh- right. why can people walk into the big box stores and yeah. wh- why are we completely restricted and shut down or what? You know, and you know, it just didn't make sense. And you know, why is people why are the people allowed to walk into Wawa? You know, if you're going to make everything takeout, then then it's everything's got to be takeout. Yeah. You know you what I mean? Then, then, then listen, you can't walk into it to Wawa and order a sandwich. Right. That's mm-hmm. got to be done online. So why why are you just confining this to our industry? So it was there was a lot of that struggle. A lot yeah. of anger. You know, and a lot of anger. A lot of anger. A lot of resentment. You know, it's it's so, it, it, yeah. get, get no. It. I mean, I, that's the point. It was there was a lot of anger, a lot of resentment to understanding and comprehending. You know, the we we really you really thought you were being punished. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think you know one of the things that I've I've talked to a lot of other licensees, owner operators, about you know we we there was a big push, a big open PA movement. There still is, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. the, the latest ones about um, restricting the governor's powers in in, in May. Mm-hmm. There, I believe it's the May fifteenth vote coming up. Um, but you know, I cautioned many uh, owner operators saying, "Listen, you know, remember the license is a privilege, not a right." A, mm-hmm. B, it doesn't matter if you're you feel like your civil rights or your your amendment or whatever is being violated. Mm-hmm. You can be violated all you want, and they pull your license. They just don't renew right. your license. Yep. That's a great so, point. So, so I, I, I you know, it's point. one thing to be a patriot, which you know, I'm. Right. I, I, I had it. I had a rally. You know, yeah, this isn't your second right, second amendment rights being infringed. No, so, it, no. It, it, it's, is, it's a privilege that's issued yeah. by the state. And although you know, you guys. Uh, you know, had to go ahead and purchase your licenses and, you know, between private parties, it's, it's, sure. it's a right, but you know, uh, and it's property, you know, according, you know, between the, the licensee and the liquor board, it's, it's a privilege. Right. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You, you know, be careful what you do and, and what you request and how you, you know, express yourself Yeah. because, you know, every, you know, People are trying to do the best they can, you know, yeah, and, and, and including the politicians, including the people that that are that are in charge of operating the liquor, and, bo- the liquor board. You know, you I, know? See, I see both sides of that fence, of course. Yeah. As I'm sure Joe feels the same way. Like there are there are guys that that are extremely angry over this, mm-hmm. and there are people that are, you know, they're upset, but they're being quiet about it, and they're doing everything right. And um, but here, this is where I really saw that they were not thinking about this business in this industry in this state was Thanksgiving Eve and it wasn't about them shutting us down at that time it was about the notice of 48 hours yeah you know this is a business that runs on margins and very small margins yes yes so to give owner operators 48 hours when that food and that beer and everything's been purchased and sitting in a walk-in and schedules have already been made mm-hmm. for reservations they, reservations yeah. when they could have done it a week 10 days prior and this this is the closure prior to thanksgiving that's correct yeah. thanksgiving Eve. that was really a punch in the that, gut that's showing that pu- us that was a yeah. punch in the gut that's showing that, us that, that they don't clo- have any boards that, that are that, giving them advice that indoor closure from that prior to thanksgiving till january 4th yeah so th- there was the one day right for the biggest hall you know the biggest day of the oh, year. oh you're talking about st patty's day well, well no. so 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 in the beginning uh, we the, started by yeah. you know Give us St. Patrick's Day. Close on the 18th for, <laughs> for the love of God, right? I'm scared. I got that. Yeah. yeah so, okay. Scared. And we get, and I got it. And I said, you know what? It is what it is. Mm-hmm. We're shutting our doors. We're, yeah, we're yeah. government. Yeah. Governor says that's what we need to do. It's what we need to mm-hmm. do. No problem. No argument. Three months it wound up being roughly. No problem. And then there was the day before Thanksgiving, the, the, from uh, 5 p.m. till 7 yeah. a.m. or whatever, mm-hmm. yeah. something like that, um, which is, you know, in theory, the biggest night of the year, um, supposedly. Huge. But, Huge. Um, and then, yeah, what really burned me was a lot of people in this industry live paycheck to paycheck. Of course. And I'd say different than other industries in my experience in, in the 14 years being owner-operator is they're very responsible people. Even though they live paycheck to paycheck. We're rule followers. They're very, they're, yes. They're very responsible people. So what I mean by that is, you know, their bills are paid. Their, their, their rent's paid. Their, you know... And this may not go for all people, but the, 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 the employees that I've had and had the experience, you know, they got their shit together. Right. And when you think of the timing of this, the first week in December, they all paid their bills and their rent. Right. right. The next three weeks are out of work. Right. How are they affording Christmas right. for the family? I had people that were just unbelievably upset. Well, it's a good and point just, that you bring up, Joe, because 
you know, I think, you know, when we talk about the anger and resentment, we're, you know, and this goes, this is like a nationwide question almost. Yeah. You know, in, in PJ, we talked about, you know, California versus Florida. You know, California, who had incredible restrictions in place during this whole COVID process. I mean, you could, you know, they had to move the, the pro and collegiate games out of Florida, sure. out, of, out of California, because, you know, they, they you know, they, they were canceling the games, as opposed to Florida, who had very lenient, you know, COVID restrictions. And, you know, what was the conclusion? The conclusion was that per capita, you know, the, really the numbers were the same. You know, right. So, you know, it, you went through this process like, show me the studies yeah. because you just said most of my patients are pretty responsible. You know, they're probably going to come into my place and, and, and you know, I'll, I'm, I'll, you know, I'm going to mandate this, but they're going to wear their masks. They're going to avoid contact with others. They're going to sanitize their hands. They're going to do all the proper things. And, you know, you know, so. And I'm also I'm going to run my business that way to make sure that that, you know, but what is perceived is what's shown on, you know, the, the media yeah. is that, you know, you have these giant clubs parties, yes, and absolutely. these house parties yeah. and these other things in place. And it's portrayed that there it is. That's the that's villain. why the yeah. spike is there because of these, you know, these, uh, you know, these clubs are now open and permitted to be open and where, you know, it was, we all wanted to, where are the studies that support the conclusion that, you know, the hospitality industry is to blame for yeah. the spread? Yeah. In you our know state, what I mean? So I think yeah. we went through that process. And I mean, I don't want to, not throwing anybody under the bus. Sure. I think our government officials did every, you know, doing just the best they can to protect their citizens. And, you know, it, it, but these are the things and these are the, you know, the, the concepts that we had and, you know, that we were thinking about. Uh, going through the process because like I said in the beginning it, it's a, it was a grueling process it still is a grueling process yeah. you know what I mean so uh, you know what else can you do but ponder and reflect on what's going on mm -hmm. so, here's so here's a question for you we talk about you know we, we kind of talked a little bit about everything um, related to COVID a little bit about enforcement a little bit about you know people's rights and, and so kind of you know what they what they can and can't do mm -hmm. Um, you know, how about now that we're, now that we're where we're at now, where we're seeing, um, you know, less restrictions, we're seeing more businesses start to open, people coming in, things sort of starting to feel a little bit normal. I know a lot of licensees that have, that got citations. They were in the $50 to $1,000 class. They were mostly serving after the curfew. Um, they were mostly serving without the food requirement mm -hmm. which is my understanding the food requirement was every time you purchase alcohol you would need that would have to be accompanied with food they should be ordered at the same time mm -hmm. um you know when you're done your food you're technically supposed to get up and, and leave the premise right so and, and for a variety of reasons um if an LC agent was in the room, maybe they would have witnessed that not happening to the T mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, certain people just said, I just got to run my business or it's going to go out. So I'm going to lose it one way or another. It's like the gym operator. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So here we are. It's, um, you know, we're, we're, it's 70 degrees out and we're, we're hopefully going to be at a point where, you know, we're mm -hmm. going to have less, uh, you know, case rates will go down like we've seen in, in the warmer weather States and, and that's the kind of thing. But now the citations have rolled in. Yeah. You know, I, I know you, you have a number of, uh, you know, uh, clients that you're representing on some of these cases. What what do we expect? What, what do we expect is going to come out of this? So is it, it a $1,000 fine? It's a great question, you know? Joe. really is because, you know, if you remember, I talked earlier about the non-renewal process. Right. Okay. And the non-renewal process and the liquor board treating that process much more seriously. And obviously, this is the governor imposing these restrictions, okay? And it's the liquor board enforcing the governor and the Department of Health director's policy, you know, mandates um, to keep everybody safe, okay? Right. So, but then at the same time, you have enforcement, you know, trying to be as accommodating as possible, being as business friendly as possible, you know, understanding, you know, the the difficulties of, of a bar owner, a restaurant owner trying to maintain their business. 
But I think you have situations, and this is my experience so far, because what's happening is, although there's been a period of time where there hasn't been any hearings, you know, the, the ALJ, the administrative law judge, really has not held here. I mean, there's been hearings here and there, but they, they for the most part in 2020, they really haven't hmm. held hearings. And the same really went for um, the liquor board to some extent, although they were they were more busy than, than the, the administrative law judge. Now, when I say the administrative law judge, I'm talking about the enforcement process. Right. Okay. Right, okay. So I really believe it depends on the circumstances. It depends on a situation where it was an enforcement just showing up at your place for a noise violation, and now all of a sudden they see uh, that you know you're not you're not serving all of the patients in conjunction with a meal, right? You know, and they're citing you for that, and they warned you for that, and you've corrected the action. Or is it like you talked about? You know, the, the guy just kind of going all out, and he's he he's not going to be able to survive, so he's just repeatedly just going to be in violation of this COVID mandate and and he's going to you know he's going to be open until two in the morning and he's not going to serve you know he's not going to seat everybody at the table right and he's he's not going to serve everything with a meal and he's not going to have those other things in place and is this repeated conduct and has this conduct been brought to his attention and he's failed to take any action to correct it? i think if you have that circumstance they're treating those licensees uh, much more seriously. Gotcha. And to be honest with you, it, it has yet to be seen. We don't know, but I think that is a very good possibility that that could become the subject matter of, of, of a non-renewal. Gotcha. Because the, I guess the argument could be made if you know if you're a Commonwealth advocate somehow. Well, you're you're putting people's lives at risk, mm-hmm. right? In a sense, right, right. Do you know what I mean? You're putting people's lives at risk. So you know, therefore, you know, we really kind of take this more seriously than anything. Sure. So from that perspective, I think you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, a situation where some licensees will have, will have a difficult experience down the road. Right. Uh, it's, it's really, it's, uh, it has yet to play out. Have, have they stated that it's going to go into the non-renewal process, the, the COVID um, fines and, and violations? It had, they have not PJ, but I'll tell you, I've had a couple, I've had some contentious enforcement citation hearings where um you know uh, when you have a situation of a licensee or a restaurant owner bar owner that are, are basically have repeatedly violated that covid rule um and you know uh, uh, my anticipation is they're going to be treated harshly gotcha so I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Is it going to be a likely suspension? Is it going to be, you know, like you said, it's a fifty to thousand dollar fine. So is it going to be a thousand dollar fine and a thirty day suspension? I don't know. Right. But it's possible. Sure. Send in a message. Yeah, absolutely. You know. So uh, that's I'm, I'm sure that you know that's going to be a possibility. That's going to play out in, in, in you know in the future, and we have to see how that's going to be dealt with as far as the non renewal process yeah. goes. I think that's kind of like now that we're back open. I think yeah. what now people are like, oh, well, oh, you know, that one Saturday, right. <laughs> you know, exactly that kind of thing. In you know? retrospect, we, maybe uh, it wasn't. Maybe such we a should. Good idea. Maybe we should have closed on time, and you know, whatever. So yeah. there's all those scenarios, mm-hmm. and, and some of it's you know fighting for, you got to pay the bills, you know, and it's, fighting for your economic life. Yeah, exactly. No, this but, is a business where, when you're operating correctly, you still feel like you're doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. That's funny you say that, PJ, because the. You know, I have plenty of clients that that talk to me about, you know, well, I don't want enforcement to come out because if they come out, they're going to find something. (laughs) And like you said, it's a lawful operation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing that's going on that's, but, you know, it's, I guess you can be scrutinized to such a point where, well, you know, and I think it goes back to the enforcement officer or the agency itself is, you know, becoming a little bit more business friendly. Do they issue a warning on the, in those circumstances? But uh, your point's well taken. You know, it's like, you know, uh, you it's know. Been a, it's you, been a very long year of feeling like that. Yeah. 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 And you're given this license really, okay, you, you know, you can all lawfully dispense alcohol to the public. Right. You know what I mean? So that, just that having that license itself is almost like, yeah. well, I don't know. I got to be doing something wrong. You know, yeah. am, I, am I over serving this guy yeah. or is, you know, how old is he? You know? Yeah. So yeah, from that perspective, it's, it's difficult. 
Awesome. Well, you know, that's, um, that's great insight. Cause I think that's what a lot of people are real worried about now. Right. And mm-hmm. it, it's a great feeling on, on, um, April 4th. I, I remember the clock ticked, uh, 1201 and I was at one of my licensed establishments and, and I just took a deep breath and yeah. I just said, you know, I thank God, thank God we're here now because at least I feel like I don't have to worry because, you know, I can't be there all the time. I certainly 100%. can't be at all three all the time. You know, so it's 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 just knowing that, you know, that that there's nothing. Now we're, we're sort of operating the way the staff knows mm-hmm. how to operate. Right, and, and right. But it goes, it goes back to what, you know, PJ brought up the patronage earlier. You know yeah. what I mean? It, doesn't it go back to your patronage a little bit too? Yeah. Like, the people that you serve and the you know you're in the community mm-hmm. you know you guys have been you know you're so established it's you know the, you know most of your patrons know you or know your management team so like yeah. you know these people like you said you know you wind up tipping when whenever however long you're open during the day they, they wind up tipping your staff and and, oh, sure. and really making it worth you know they're, they're coming out forever you know however long they can and you know it's the, the it's the community that's supporting you yeah. And, 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 you know, f- taking you through this process and, you know, many, you know, there's, I think there's licensees out there that don't have that benefit, you yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, and, you know, a lot of this too, what your situation is as far as whether you're owning or whether you're leasing is the difference between night and day right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has that's, been. that's a great point, PJ. Yeah. That's an, that's an excellent point because you're right. That is, that is the one thing you can't control, right? That yeah. is, although, you know, there is, you know, there are, you know these you know um ordinances and laws in place and filling and and you know where you know may prevent a landlord from yeah, from uh, eviction, later. eviction process they came later down the road you know yes. nonetheless you know what's your relationship with your landlord you know and you know what kind of treatment are you getting from your landlord to kind of bring you through this process yeah. and and you know that's that's huge we had somebody on the podcast um, who was speaking with somebody who's involved with the Hudson Development Project in Manhattan, mm-hmm. and they were saying that they really see that the commercial uh, property business, especially in the cities, is going to go into a profit sharing mode. As far as you know, wow. instead of your your typical um, uh, lessee lessor, you know, mm-hmm. sure, and it makes kind of, it makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I mean, you know, on that note, um, I know there's some. A lot of things happening right now in mm-hmm. our state mm-hmm. with regards to you know, some le- le- legislative changes for licensees. Mm-hmm. You want to comment on a few of those? Yeah. So uh, we, we talked about a couple of them. You know, we talked about the you know um, the lo- you know the accommodation that was passed back in 2020 as far as the the, the governor, and I think it, it passed it the, the liquor <clears throat> board that you know where the liquor board's going to waive those renewal and validation fees for 2021 you know that that's in place at this point um there are uh we talked about the now this isn't law i think this still has to pass the yeah, senate I a lot of it. Yep. yeah so you know there's there's a house bill in place that's that's going to um possibly increase the the discount from 10 percent to 15 percent for for licensees when they go and purchase wine and liquor at at, at the state stores it's real money yeah, that's real money. And then you have uh, what's the other accommodation? There is another one. Um, there the, was um, what I heard was uh, something along the lines of oh um, the the inventory. Yes. So if so, you were to go out of business. Yeah. So now you know the, the the restaurant owners and and the bar owners, if they put their license in safekeeping and they've been closed for an extended period of time and oh. and they don't have the possibility of reopening or they've that's decided the to go out of business and they have inventory that's on the premises they no longer have to you know the the requirement was you, it's got to either go back to the liquor board or be destroyed i was you know. just going to drink it all <laughs> <laughs> or you can <laughs> consume it <laughs> we're getting out of business i'm drinking, I'm drinking it all yeah i'm already miserable <laughs> So you can actually sell it to another restaurant owner, oh, another good. bar owner. All that stuff has to be documented and submitted back to the liquor board, but that's available to the to the you know to the licensee. Um, yeah. So and then there's going to hopefully maybe there's some accommodations with regards to the off premises catering. Yeah. You know, I heard that you, you you know don't know if it's 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 going to pass, but we talked you know we talked about the possibility of 
of those events possibly going past midnight or go, maybe not past midnight, but more than five, but hours. More, more than five yeah. hours, more than five hours. Um, and then maybe more than just, you know, the 52 times a year. Right. You know, I don't know if they're doing, you know, maybe they're considering that because, you know, you know, who who knows how long, much longer these restrictions are going to are going to be in place for indoor dining. Yeah, so, sure. you know, they've made the off premises or I'm sorry, they've made the extension of premises such an easier process now, you know, right. during this COVID world. Yeah. And so maybe they're also going to do that with, with with regards to the off premises catering and make make that available to licensees that they can have these events off the licensed areas. Um, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. So, you know, um, those are kind of the ones that just come to mind right now. Um, yeah, that's great. I mean, they're, yeah. they're all steps in the right direction. Like I said, you know, I've always felt that the LCB has been, you know, a pleasure to work with mm -hmm. more so now than ever. Yeah. Um, you know, so, COVID has been stressful for everybody, but, but, you know, the, just the attitude in which they come in with when they do it in inspections, it's, mm -hmm. it's very much a, Hey, just checking in house things, you know, like, mm -hmm. Here's what we need to see, pop, 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 get right. you through the process, good to go. Yeah. And, um, you know, what I used to always love is getting the letters when they do, getting the letters saying we were in and did it yeah. undercover and you passed with flying colors, basically. Yeah. You get Those a great, you, you get actually feel good. So, frame them. I frame so, them, yeah. so when they do the, we talked about the compliance yeah. investigations, you know, like, okay, so, you know, a restaurant owner gets hit with, with, with serving a minor, you know, now you're on a radar and in all likelihood, enforcement's coming back to do at least a compliance you know sure. maybe they maybe they do a minor inspection but they're going to come back and do a compliance so the liquor code provides for this you know um where they they can actually put together a you know they they, they actually hire an underage kid they have an underage kid uh -huh. where they can actually send an underage kid into the premises to, to to try and make a purchase and that's that's what they call a compliance check so you're at the very least going to get a compliance check but you know, if you've if you've done the right things as a restaurant owner, you know, hopefully, you know, you possibly have a scanning yep, system in place sure. and, and train. You know, you get ramp training, et cetera. I get the phone calls from the client, and because they're if if they do the compliance check, enforcement's required to send you a letter of compliance. Right, right. and you get that letter; it's like a feather in your cap. Yeah, like that, nice. that's something okay, that that, nice. that like yes, I've passed. I've passed. You know, <laughs> yeah. I've got over that hurdle. Yeah. yeah, so that's something that's uh, it's it's nice to have, especially yeah. if if there if you got issues with your operation. Yeah, yeah certainly, certainly. You know, we uh, well, we're going on sixty seven years at, at my place, the three generations, not one underage, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just ruined it. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean that's that's a that's a credit to to yeah. truly PJ. That's a credit. That's you know what, what what was the Rocky movie like? You know, he, how many how many fights and he didn't get his nose broke, right? You know what I mean? He was all proud of that. <laughs> he had it bent and people pulled on it. <laughs> well, listen, we we talked about a lot of things today, and um, you know, one thing that I want to be absolutely clear on, even though we did say this in your uh, bio at the beginning of the episode, mm -hmm. is just that you know. Um, we talk a lot about the regulations and laws and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth and some of your experiences, but certainly anybody that um, is listening and is interested in this, um, certainly by all means, they should, they should consult an, an attorney, um, especially, uh, you know, somebody specialized in, in liquor license, um, you know, in, in sort of the ins and outs. Um, uh, you know, is there anything else you want to say with no, Bruce's th that's, disclaimer on that? That's great, Joe. And I appreciate that. So, yeah, I mean, we talk in general terms, you know, we talk, you know, we talk about the liquor code, we talk about the regulations and, you know, uh, touched on some things in, in New Jersey. But, you know, if, if you're, if, if you're going, if you're interested in acquiring a liquor license or you have a liquor license and you want to, you know, you have any questions or, or, or you know, consult with a, a private attorney who's knowledgeable in this area. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's really the thing to do, uh, you know, um, you know, don't, re you know, you know, this is not something you want to rely on for, for you know, uh, running your, you know, if you have issues with your operation, you have issues with your license, consult with a private attorney. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Advocate. Yeah. 
Well, Ed, thanks a lot. It's yeah, been man. great. Hey, thanks so it's much, awesome. guys. It was yeah. a pleasure to see you guys and, and, and hang out with you and, and talk with you. It was Very been informative. Been Absolutely. Well, nothing but we'll, a pleasure. We'll have you on again because yeah. I'm sure we'll things will change and you know we'll see what of it's course. like. By then, maybe we'll have a brewery because so of far course. I want. <laughs> now listen, I, 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 I want I want uh, you know I want the headline. If if if, if McRogan's going to be on too, uh, <laughs> I want the headline. <laughs> no, he'll never let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. thank you. It was a pleasure, guys. Thanks, Sam. Okay.